miraculous, really. <laughs> Normally, we over time, now we're under time. We thought, well, we're all here. We've all eaten well and uh, enjoyed the great food. And so now we will just um, be about 15 minutes earlier, which means we have much more, a lot of time that uh, we can give our guest speaker later on and uh, we can have a great time of fellowship. Um, I'd like to um, just um, uh, make a few comments before the speaker. And uh, I'm not giving any directives to anyone, but um, you know, this is Lord of the Nations Christian Church Men's Group. Maybe one, is it, have we got an official name now, Jaime, or are we still working on it? And anyway, it's just good to be together as men, you know, and uh, I've always been a full supporter and active uh, leader in men's groups in years gone by, and uh, I've actually brought along, um, oh dear, that's the force of gravity, still works. <laughs> it's good to know that, isn't it? Uh, in my possession of, of a library, I have a huge library. I have so many books, I don't know where to put them. But I have a very treasured li library that's of my men resource uh, library. And I have in my possession a volume, uh, it's, it's quite a big, thick volume like this. I have, it's a, a part one, I have part two, and this is a men's manual. You know, I acquired that. In the, in the 1980s from a fellow missionary who had one. And he said, Con, he said, I, I looked at it and I said, wow, this is real good stuff for men, specially formulated to make men, men of God, especially sections for fathers. And um, so I've looked after it and I read it from time to time. I've used it in my sermons and different things, a tremendous resource. And you know what, guys? I just thought, uh, you know, uh, I want to make a statement here uh, before I go into this. You know, this book contains seven laws of fatherhood. Seven laws. I'll just mention one or two quickly, because later on we can have a look at it further on. And uh, I don't want to take uh, anything away from what um, uh, 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 our speaker has to say today, and uh, rather uh, lay a good foundation for him, I'm sure, because he's a fellow Christian, and uh, so we share a lot of things in common. You know, yesterday I was watching TV in the, one of the news commentaries, and, you know, there was an Anglican statement made about this same-sex marriage that we're all going to have to vote on. And the statement was astounding. You know, I didn't know what to, whether to feel angry or what. Oh, I thought, this is amazing. They talked about, uh, apparently they, some of the leaders are changing to say that same-sex marriage is okay. You know, well, Okay, the thing is what they were saying, that marriage um, and, and the ownership of marriage. And they made this statement that marriage can be owned. It's not owned by the church. It's not owned by a man and a woman, but anybody can own it. You know, two men can own it. Two women can own it. And I didn't, I felt emotions arise up within me. One of them was a holy anger, you know. How can they do that? Marriage is owned by the Lord. He ordained it in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis. And he ordained it to be between a man and a woman, you know. How dare they? Next thing we'll be having is a marriage between dogs. Why not? If you're going to go that way. You know? 
Well, it's the form of marriage between a bull and a cow or something, or two bulls or two cows. This is sky's the limit. When you move away from the foundation of what God has said, you know, I'm speaking from a very strong biblical viewpoint because in my life, when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible is the book that God has given to us. A book to live by, a book that is a blessing, a book that gives us life and leads us to heaven and has so many good things about the Word of God. So, you know what I mean? I thought to myself, wow, there's another statement I want to make. Fatherhood. Fatherhood is owned by men. Right? You're a man. You're a father. Or you're a young, people, young person today. You have inherited. You're going to be a father someday as you marry and have a family. You know, this is an ordination from God. I'm a man. I'm a father. I'm a I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather now, you know? And I've been married to the same woman for 54 years, you know? And I thank God for that, because I accepted the Lord when I was a young man, and I followed the Word of God. I reap, we reap what we sow. I stand here in good health, and I think I'm still the same mind, <laughs> you know? And I still have my family. I have worked as a pastor for many years, well over 50 years or more, and um, married my wife when I was young, and we both followed God and did ministry together. And, um, you know, I'm the principal, particularly of the church I belong to at the time, we put God first, family second, and the work of God comes third. So the most important thing that I've always nurtured is to be a father, you know? And my, my mentors were godly men who exonerated that fatherhood was important. And for us to be a father to our family was the most important thing we could do. Because if we lead well in our family as a father, our, our, our family would be follow in the, in the ways of God. Our wives would be a blessing to us, you know, as we take our stand as being a father for the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I trust that you're with us today. One more thing I'd like to say is that um, in this book here, we've got seven laws of fatherhood. And they, um, one of the main ones is, is to be kind and loving in all what we do. And that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard one sometimes, because sometimes we get angry. We get angry at our children, or we get angry at our wife, and likewise they can get angry with us. But you know, there's one thing about it. You know, because us, as men, we all have different characters, and different in the way we are. But you know, as Christians, um, we have faith in God. The Bible says all things are possible him that believe. All things are possible with God. And the, the ability for God to change us into his image is there all the time. You know, the encounter with a living God who lives within us by the power of the Holy Spirit and who works to change in us. You know, from glory to glory he's changing us. And, you know, we have a uh, as Christians, we believe in the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And to know the Father heart of God. You and I had this intimate in that intimacy with God as our Father, who loves us. He sent His Son. The Son enables us to have access to the Father and all that good stuff. He changes us into His image. So for us, when we hear things to be a good Father, well, some of us are very honest and say, well, I'm not, I'm not 100% a good father. Well, don't worry about that. 
I'd look to Jesus and ask him to change us to become good fathers. Strong men of God. Just a couple of closing. Be kind and loving in all what you do. Some of the other things here is um, a father must be in a continual state of, gra of, of, of gratefulness to God. And the thing is that we um, um, have this attitude sometimes to get grumpy or get negative. Don't, get, don't go there. Ask God to, to, to change us and to have this. Thank you, Lord. This is the day you have made. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for the woman you gave me. Thank you, Lord, for the children. And it, you have this transforming attitude that we can accomplish this. To be kind and loving in all that we do. That's a challenge. But, you know, we can become those sort of people after God's own heart by being willing to be open to be changed and feel the challenge of the Holy Spirit within us for eternal change. This is the greatest mission we can be on in our life, a journey of being a great father. It pays enormous dividends, particularly as you get older. You know, because your children begin to look after you. And I know that in family life that's very normal and that's the way it should be. So. I'm going to ask now John Bacalaris to come and share an item with us. So John, please come. John is one of our leading musicians in our church. And uh, you know what? When he leads in singing, he leads like a typical young person. Now, I'm 77 years old, but I join my heart to this young man. And he just encourages us to worship and praise God. You know, and I, I thank him for his youthfulness that he puts into our congregation. Because, you know, it's easy to get into a trap. I'm an old man now, you know. I'm not an old man. I'm a young man inside. Yeah. And uh, young people like that keep us young. I love young people because our association with them keeps us young in heart. Thank you, John. God bless you. Before we start, I'm just going to sing a song about Father in, he uh, Father in Heaven. How good it is. and Maybe some of you might know this song. So if you know this song, just sing it with me. You are perfect in all of your ways. 
You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good, good part. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am, your good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am, your good, good father. Awesome song. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker John Bennett. I don't much about him, but he's a brother in Christ. And at his last meeting at Fremantle that time, the great uh, concepts of being the father in the fathering program. And also a special welcome to our visitors with us today. It's a real privilege to uh, have you. And also we're grateful to the uh, Apostolic Church of Gosnells and uh, the couple of members here. We appreciate being at the usual facility and, uh, and it's going to be a real blessing this morning. Uh, thank you, John, and we look forward to a great word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. There's more seats up here, guys. Yes. Come on down if you'd like. I love Father's Day because it reminds me back in 1999 when my wife was expecting our first child and um, I kept on asking, it was due, child was due at the end of August and I kept on asking, am I getting Father's Day? To which she responded, a dirty nappy and a sick to pond bib. 540s on, on the Father's Day, 5th of September 1999, I became a father. So Father's Day and my daughter really relates well. So I thought I'd do a little quiz today. We've got a lovely book, Fathering in the Fast Lane. Who's got a child? Now I want you to work out which child is born closest to Father's Day. So Father's Day, the 3rd of September. Any children born late August, early September, you've got? 13. First, have we got anyone closer than the, to the third? No, third of September. Okay, we've got our winner here. Great book. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about Bruce Robinson. It's Fathering in the Fast Lane. He's a local West Australian. And in fact, he's the founder of the Fathering Project. So if we could have the next slide, please. This morning, and I'm going to... Come forward a little bit because I need to be able to see what's up on the screen. A little bit about the Fathering Project, a little bit about myself, and um, what we're going to be covering today. Now today is not special significant advice for your particular child. What we're giving is general fathering tips, best practice, <coughs> share the research, what we know is being, what is working out there. Um, but we don't have specific um, advice to be able to give you. I'm not qualified to give you that sort of advice. Who am I? Well, I was born in Perth. I spent 23 years away from Perth, came back in 2010. Um, married, got two children, two lovely girls, and uh, they're eight, 18 and 16. Well, about to turn 18. So the, the wonderful uh, teenage and finishing school years. Um, so I'm a father of two. I'm a father figure and an uncle for nine um, nephews and nieces. And at my local church, I'm, I'm a father figure for about 20, 25 children as well. And I'm also a father figure to my daughter's friends. Four to on that one. Today we're going to talk about fathers. And I'll clarify, also father figures. The reality is, in Western society, a lot of uh, blended and different marriage, marriage relationships 
we don't always have the perfect mother, father, and two children at home. So when I'm using the term fathers, we actually look for father figures, and that could be a teacher, it could be a pastor, a youth pastor, a sports coach, an uncle, a grandparent, and we'll explore a little bit of that later on. So the Fathering Project was set up about 10 years ago by Bruce Robinson. Now in 2015, he was the West Australian of the Year, recognising the work he'd done professionally, but more importantly within the Fathering Project. Now Bruce is a doctor, he specialised in um, lung surgery, and he's also a professor at the University of Western Australia. And what got him going was on their deathbed, too many men saying two very common traits coming through. One, they took work far too seriously and they spent too long thinking about work, and thinking and trying to do too much work away from what was important to them. The second one was, he heard, I wish I had have spent more time with my kids. So two important things. So he then went and did a fair amount of research, if that's just his style. A lot of research in, in that field to actually find out what's out there for fathers. Just as a side, work, who's, who's trained for their job? So if I could go to another point. Who does, who's, who's trained, educated, been given um, practice and skills? Just a show of hands. Who's done specific training for their job? You might be an accountant, you might be a, a surveyor, yeah? Fathering's pretty important, isn't it? Yes. Who did training to be a father? <laughs> <laughs> so today, there's a little bit like professional development. As, as, as in your job, you need to keep abreast and um, up to date with what's happening. And keep reminded, if you're a little bit like me, I keep getting the to be reminded um, on things. I don't always pick them up the first time. And same it is with fathering. I don't always get it right. I'm not a perfect dad. I'm a pretty good dad. I'm trying to get better. That's what I am. And that days like this and understanding that we can have and sharing of information is very good. Now apologies in one of the things I'm going to say today is I'll use some generalization. But one of the biggest parts of generalizing that I've looked around and said is mums are pretty good at sharing information and opening up about concern. Men tend to think if you open up with concerns, it's a sign of weakness. You keep that to yourself. I don't need to tell other people about it. And we're not as open to say, hey, look, have you tried something? My son or daughter, have you got any ideas? We might do it, but we don't do it anywhere near as much as mums do it. So one of the things that we're going to do today is we're going to actually start talking a little bit between each other. Men quite often like to sit, as you are, right now, alongside. And so I'm going to encourage you, when you think about it, when you go to the football, you, sit, you stand or sit alongside and you're looking out. Bars are built for men to be able to stand alongside. We're not particularly good at coming in and actually turning in and talking eye to eye as well. So we're going to do a little bit of that today. It might feel a little bit uncomfortable. Just work on it. Except it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but we're going to spend some time in your little groups having some discussions. I'm good on that. Thank you. Can we go forward two slides, please? That's it. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today are prevention and preventing the negatives. And some of the things we're going to talk about today will be about some of the good things that fathering does do. So it's not just all stopping the negatives. The research that has been undertaken both in Western Australia, around Australia and in America, is showing the one thing that makes a significant difference in a child's life to stop the negatives and to improve the positives is an effective father in a child's life. It's pretty simple, an effective father. There are fathers still in the family, under the family house, still married, 
that are struggling to be effective. So just because you're married doesn't mean that the fathers are still effective. Reality as well is there's some really good dads in distance relationships and not <coughs> whole families that are really good dads and are effective in their child's life. Obviously, you've got to work on it a lot harder if you're not under the same roof. But that's one of the aspects that, um, that has come out very clear in, in the research. So if you go to some of the aspects that are out there, some of the negatives, if we can have the next slide, thanks. Less suicides, less violence, less incarceration in the law, arrests. The children that have an effective father are more likely to attend school. They're more likely to have extracurricular activities and be successful in it. They're more likely to be trying harder when you go further into their education. And this is coming out, some of, some of the numbers are four to 30 times more likely to occur with an effective father. So these aren't just a five, 10% improvement. These are major, major differences. Interestingly, and one of, one of the things I've researched a bit more is the, where you have daughters. A father and his impact on a daughter really helps her with her, um, with her mental health. Interestingly, one in four girls is likely to have mental health issues over their life. That number doubles if they don't have an effective father in their life. Wow, pretty scary. So today is about finding ways to be good dads. So I'm gonna get you to work in your groups of three or four, or five, whatever you've got. Um, I want you to talk about what you think makes a good dad. It doesn't have to be about yourself. It doesn't have to be about your father. But we're gonna spend two minutes just talking. Make sure you, you don't, you know, each of your table has a bit of a chance to talk. What do you think, uh, in essence, makes a good dad? Okay, next slide, please.
Okay, thank you for that. You're going to get a chance to continue the discussion in, in a moment. Can we go forward two slides, please? Next one. One more, thanks. Okay, now Bruce is a doctor. Doctors like to prescribe things to get you better. Men like action as well. It's one of the reasons sometimes my wife doesn't want to tell me a problem. She says, you just want to fix it. Sometimes my night just want to talk about it. But the big W pill, that's what Bruce has put together as the solution. Any ideas what, and for those that came to the session a month ago, you're not included in this one. What do you think the W stands for? Yes. Lots of ideas, W. Going to help the children. Going to help them with their self-confidence. Worthwhile. Okay. Now it's interesting. Out of the um, problems with the some of the indigenous communities up north, there's a lot of um, additional information coming up and saying the children have got to improve their self-worth. Worthwhile, self-worth, a similar thing. And that's our job as dads to help that. It's your job. It's my job. It's your job to make your nephews, your nieces, your other children that you're a father figure to, you've got to improve their self-worth. They make them feel well, worthwhile. But there is no W pill. Unfortunately, there is no W pill. But what we've got is a three-part solution to what we can do. Next slide, thanks. Who in work has acronyms? Three-lettered acronyms. And we've got one today to help you, to help you really remember about the bus. B, U, and S. Now I'm gonna help you with the first one. The first real key to being a great dad is being there. That's the B, being there. The second one, you're a dad, it's unconditional. The good, the bad, it doesn't matter, it's unconditional. And the third part, for every child, find something special. Okay? Now we're gonna drill into these a little bit a little bit uh, deeper. So if you could have the next slide, please. So that was me and my daughter and my wife back in 1999 on that Father's Day. Loved it. Easy to be there when it's when they when it's birth, but it's easy to be there on Father's Day. But being there is an important aspect, and I've got a wonderful. I've, I've actually had the benefit for the last four years of being a home dad. So I've worked in oil and gas and spent a lot of time overseas as an expatriate. Risen pretty well. My wife was at home. We, we prioritise that, um, having a parent at home. And my wife retrained and about 2013 I had a chance to say, how about you go out to work and I'll just do a bit of part-time work, but I would have been a home dad. So I announced to my youngest two, three weeks ago that next year I'm going to go back to work. Well, I hope to. She said, oh, but who's going to be there when we come home, Dad? I enjoy the times that we come home and we talk and we do things together. They're not fancy. They're not, they're not expensive. And Thursday when she came home, we had a game of Monopoly Deal. It wasn't exciting. It was a wonderful time we had. But being there, invest in every child. Now, um, some ideas about being there. Busy lives that we've got, aren't they? But did anyone FIFOing? Flying out home for a job? Tough, isn't it? You're away. I spent a lot of time in my career at Shell away from home. Um, and I've got a little anecdote on how my mind was changed by my wife. She said, John, you're about to go to Houston for nearly three weeks. Oh, we've got a, a nine month old and a nearly three year old. We're in a strange country, I'm away. 
And the previous time I'd gone away, I actually came home and said, I feel really embarrassed because I didn't recognize my daughter's face like I usually do. She changed over three weeks. Um, I felt bad, but you know, I talked about it and it came out and said, well, I'll tell you what, this was about, that. this was a, a couple of years later when they'd started kindy at, at school. She said, here are some yellow post-it notes. Every day you are away for school, just, you're gonna be away for 14 days, write them a note, and I'll put it in their lunchbox. I thought, well, that's pretty good. I said, well, what do I write? And so she got the yellow post-it notes, and she said, have a fantastic Monday. Hope assembly goes well on Thursday. Good luck with your sports game on Wednesday, whatever it might have been. We're not talking about anything fancy. I didn't have to be that creative. I wrote them out in my horrible writing, and she put them in their lunch boxes. When I came home, both of the girls said, Dad, you thought about us every day you were away from home. Thank you, I knew I was loved. Thank you for what you did. I, I had to thank my wife, I've got all the credit for it. She, put, she came up with the idea, she told me what to write, she put it in the lunch boxes, but I connected with my daughter. Skype, what a way to go. I could read them stories when I was away and put them to bed with the story. Maybe you don't have connection. You've got a phone, you can actually record, especially when they're younger, a nice story for the children. And the good thing is when children are under five, you can probably read the same story to them 10 days in a row and they're very, very happy. It's a way of you connecting, using, using technology, but prioritizing. A lot of stories about dads who are self-employed, you've got a big project on, you're traveling away, you're still at home, but you're not able to connect with your children. And part of that means how do you prioritize it? How do you spend that time with each and every child. So I'm gonna get you to talk in your little groups again. Being there, what are some of the special things that you can do, or how do you go about making sure that you spend the time with your children and you are there as their dad? Just some ideas to share some tips. Maybe you've been away from home. How do you cope with schedules Monday to Friday when you have overtime? whatever it might be. Share some ideas about being there. What have you seen and what have you, what have you done that works really well to be there with your children? We've got about three, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
you off which is really good I'm happy to cut you off because I'll invite you to actually continue those discussions later on okay some great ideas you can get thinking why didn't I think of that all fantastic okay who remembers the you what's the you being there you are unconditional next slide please my mother told me John you can get married it's important but people get divorced can get divorced. Next big thing in life, you can buy a home. Sell that home. You get the financial difficulties. It's not that life changing if you buy a home then sell it. The, th the next one is that of being a father. Once you become a father, there's no giving that back. You don't give a baby back and say, I'm no longer your father. That's unconditional. That is the unconditional part need to understand. It doesn't depend upon performance. Can I don't know if you can see there. Can I have the net just press once more? Yeah. They're my two girls. The one on the right is an eagle supporter. West Coast Eagles. That's a photo of me taking her to a game. The one on the left has gone to the dark side. <laughs> He's a Dockers supporter. <laughs> but I still took her to an open training session and she got some Dockers autographs. It's not conditional on her. My love on her, for her, is not conditional for her becoming a West Coast fan. My love for her is unconditional, even if she goes to the dark side. <laughs> the children that have the greatest needs are often the ones or the times when it's most frustrating. Mm. You've got to remember what unconditional is. You don't lose your temper because they're not going to come back to you the next time. You keep getting mad, losing your temper. You've got to be there for them with love. My brother told me a good story. He said he told his one and only little precious princess daughter, only one child he's got, where, as she was about 17, 18. If ever you're at a party and you don't feel safe, you need picking up, call me. Any place, any time, I'll be there. About 1.30 one morning, he got a phone call. Dad, don't be mad with me, but the person who I came with to the party has had a bit too much to drink. I don't feel comfortable. There's a, we've been waiting for taxis for over an hour. Can you come and pick me up and drop a couple of my friends home? Sure, darling, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Went there, didn't talk about well, why didn't your friend not drink? Why didn't you pre order a taxi? He just said, you, you okay? Any other friends you want dropping home? I want to make sure you're safe. That's that unconditional, you're there for them in their time of need. Very simple example, but it's made me think how do I do that one? How do I make sure that I don't criticise them at the time? Maybe a week later, if something's not right, you can have a good chat about it as to how they got into that position. But at their time of need, you want to be there unconditionally. So again, I'm going to get you to talk in your little groups. Think about good times or think about challenges. When do we as dads need to be showing that unconditional love? Have a little chat for a couple of minutes. Now, this isn't... This is not an easy, easy one to talk about, by the way. I normally get feedback that that's pretty tough talking about unconditional things. But that's okay. We can talk about it.
Okay, thank you for that. One of the things I've learned is to hear the group and you've got some wonderful conversations going on there, which is excellent. So well done. Okay, the S. Yes. Remember? Yeah. Very quick. Could you maybe a couple more? I'm not sure. Yeah. Couple more? One more? Oh, no, go back, sorry. So again, there are my two girls finding something special. We're not talking about elite. They don't have to be the best in Western Australia about. But what's special about them? And that's your job as a dad to find that, to explore that, and to nurture it. I love to sing. My daughter, that's my that's our local church. And uh, that's a concert we had one afternoon. My eldest daughter singing. She's got a real gift of the voice. The bottom one has no voice. That's her netball. I've taught her to be a little bit tougher. Um, but she has a wonderful ear and plays the, um, plays the trombone. Just love it. She's, she's, I've, I've nurtured that one with her. It's something we've encouraged over the years. And at the beginning of this year, she auditioned and got into the <coughs> West Australian Jazz Youth Orchestra playing the trombone. Wow. So you look at that and you think, I've got two very different girls. Find out what's so special about each one and nurture and, and develop that. So this is a real easy conversation. You're only allowed one child. It's either a child, a grandchild, a nephew, a niece, or someone you're a father figure to. I'm going to get you to wait, think for about 30 seconds. What is special? What special gift? What have they got that's special? And then you're going to share it on your table. And if you don't smile, you're not, you're not, you're not really getting the, the flavor of this one. Because normally I just see someone says, what's special about your daughter? And you think, oh. straight away, there's a smile. There's good things to think about. OK? So hopefully you've had some thinking time. Spend a little moment telling the people on your table what's special about a child in your life.
Make sure your whole table gets to share it. You've got about 30 seconds left. special. Really encourage you on that. So remember the acronym? BUS. Get on the bus, dads. Just get on that bus. I've got three little tips for you. Really practical tips. You might want to write them in your phone or jot them down, take a photo of them. First tip, please. <coughs> Who's heard of dad dates? Anyone? Okay. Let me tell you, I actually read a book by Steve Biddle when I became, as I was about to become a dad in 1999. Steve Biddle's a Tasmanian, wrote a wonderful book about raising happy boys. I read it, proceeded to have two girls, realized there are some differences, and only in 2010, he wrote another book, Raising Happy Girls. <sighs> I'm a boy. I read it, I heard about dad dates, I read about dad dates. I actually forgot about dad dates until about 2009. Did different dad dates. I'd take both girls away with me, and mine was more relieving mum and spending family time together. But I've got to tell you, there's a part about dad dates. No other children and no other adults. In other words, you and that child, one-on-one. -on -one. I had a great rapport with the two girls. I actually learned a lot more from my daughters when I had a one-on-one -on -one time. So what's a dad day? Don't go to the cinema. You sit in, the, sit in your chair and you're watching the screen, you don't talk. But if you're gonna take them to the cinema, go for a meal beforehand. Okay. I've got three examples up there. The top one, top right, is me taking my youngest to a WA football local league game. It's free for under 15s to get in. I actually go, the first two or three times we went, I left at half time. I'm not a bad sport. We weren't losing. My daughter had enough. We had a nice time at the football. We'd gone out for a kick. We'd had some good things to do. Underneath there is I'm taking my sister's youngest son to, to an event. There's a selfie I took with he and I. Um, the, the third one there is a dad and a daughter. I don't know them, but they've, they've gone shopping. Oh, can I give you a tip? Who's got a daughter? Do they like shopping? No, no? not do. It's not a generalization, but I as a dad, didn't know what the difference between procurement and shopping was. Now when I go shopping, I need a shirt. 
I'm going to go to my favourite place for a shirt, hopefully when it's on sale, because yeah. I don't like spending as much money. If I walk out, well, I'm only going to spend 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes in that shop anyway. If I haven't got my shirt within five or 10 minutes, I have failed. If I don't walk, if I don't come home with what I went for, I have failed. I'm very task orientated. That's called procurement. That's my daughter took, and, and, and I struggled with my wife and my daughter when we go shopping. My daughter said, Dad, can we go shopping as a dad date? And I said, oh, I'm not really good at it. And then we negotiated what shopping was. We went to Karen Up Mall. We split a subway. I don't like paying for two six inches. We have to agree and negotiate so we can get the cheaper 12 inch. And that's fun. We got a drink. She ended up arm in arm. She was holding my arm, walking down. We spent an hour and didn't buy a damn thing. <laughs> it wasn't about shopping. It was about spending time in a mall, doing things together and having fun. Do not get the idea that you've got to spend money and be Father Christmas with lots of presents and lots of expensive things to make a good dad day. Not at all. That's the first really good tip. Now with a dad day, work it out. My, my, my recommendation is make it part of your custom and habit. What can you commit to? Is it once a month? Is it once every three months? stick to it. I did these with my daughters and we've been negotiated them and put them in when I was working and I'm spending, it was an important time for me to connect with them. My wife then said, John, stop, stop bringing it upon them. Like tomorrow we're going on a dad day. She said, the girls look forward to it. Plan it with them, include it. And the excitement builds in the week. Oh, we've got a dad day coming up on Saturday. They're thinking, and they, they make it special. It's part of what they want to do, not just what I want to do. So that's worked really well for me. Every dad I've spoken to has said, that's a great idea. But I don't think I've heard anyone say it's not a good idea. And when I've returned to places, the overwhelming response is, oh, those dad dates, wow, why didn't I start them early? So remember, no other adults, and no other children. That's my first really useful tip. The second tip, take your holidays together. Yeah. Really, really important. And I've deliberately got a couple of holidays there. One we went up to um, Calvary. The other one is I've taken to camping. It's really, really fun. For a guy who spent a lot of time in five-star hotels traveling the world, my idea of camping, that's the last thing I would have wanted to have done. But not be more. We've got the equipment. We now go out there, but basically, if, you, if you're going to stay at a motel or somewhere, a little house, if you buy your camping equipment, you've soon built, built up a pretty good camping supply. And we do some really good fun basic things. That's down at Nanga Mill with my two girls. And um, we have some wonderful times on family holidays. Really, really good. And we play cricket. There you go, there's a picture of my daughter and I'm, I'm the wicket keeper. No pads, it's a rubbishy ball, it's in a gravel area. There's nothing special or fancy about it. But they still talk about, oh, can we go and play cricket, Dad? You actually let down your guard, you swim in dirty river water. There's not a blue pool where we, where we go camping. It's wonderful. Lots of good things, but take your annual holidays and spend them with the family. Third tip. One more, thanks. The research has shown that when dads have the talk with girls and boys, it's more effective. Don't outsource that to the mother. That's your job as dads. Yes, there's a protector, a guardian, and so forth. But you are the one more effective to have those discussions. Is it about sex? Is it about drinking? Is it about smoking? Is it about drugs? It's risk taking. That's our job to have those discussions. My youngest, when she was about 12, said, Dad, I'm too young to have these discussions. 
I said, well, are they disturbing you? She said, no, but I'll, I, when, it's, when it's closer to my time. And I said, well, darling, we're going to talk about this before it's relevant. I'd rather that than talking to you when it's too late. And I'll explain my eldest is a little bit more feisty. I said, well, what happens if someone comes to a party you're at and they might be passing some drugs around? She said, well, I'd get up there and tell him to get lost. I said, okay. What about if it's happening and some of your friends have partaken of it? Dad, my friends aren't that stupid. Okay, so I'm getting closed down here. I'd encourage you to make sure you don't get closed down. Keep the discussion going. She said, well, what about if she, he offers you? He said, well, I'd get up and push him and maybe kick him in the nuts or something like that and whack him. I said, well, not everyone's as friendly and nice as you're used to. That man might hit you back. So we went exploring, exploring, exploring. And in the end, it's like, help them, give them tools and tips. And I said to them, and they've now come up with their own tips. So if they're passing drugs around, you want to actually not worry about that, not partake of it, but not be ostracized for being whoever. Give them ideas, I've got netball tomorrow morning, I need to be on top of my game, thanks but no thanks. Give them tips as to how to get away from it. Tips that you've got a boyfriend. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of issues with social, um, social media and girls being pressured to send photos and pictures of themselves some inappropriate to boyfriends at the time. Have a discussion. What does that look like if you break up? What does it look like? And on and on you go. So you, you're trying to help them and guard them. You can't be there for them. You want to have the common sense in the back of their head that says, I remember that talk with dad. And I gave him a hard time for keeping on having those discussions with me. How did he teach me? So you want them to be able to think for themselves when you're not there. You can't be there when the pressure's on them all the time. You don't want to be a helicopter parent that stops them from being in, in life. And life has risks and there are people around them. You need to arm them with the right way of saying no. Yep, that's your job as dads. Don't leave it for the mother because you will be more effective on general than the mother. Or do it together, but make sure it's okay. Go talk to your mother about that. No, don't, don't do that. Get involved, get engaged. Again, don't preach them. If they're told what to do, they're not going to think for themselves. Make the discussion something that they'll come up with their own ideas as to what goes well. Practical ways to cope. Not to just avoid it and walk away from it or never go to a party or never associate with Know, it's going to happen all around them, help them cope in that environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Next slide, thank you. I want to recognise the job that mums do. But one of the things that um, Bruce Robinson says is, why are, we, why are we highlighting the dads? Well, generally the mums are doing a pretty good job. Okay? the dads we need to pick up our game a little bit but we want to recognize that this is a partnership and it's a teamwork you're going to you're going to parent slightly differently than your partner that's the fact you don't think 100 percent the way your your partner thinks but the big issues get aligned on teamwork and the better you are aligned as a team the less divided you will be for your children. Children love rules and they like knowing where the lines are. If you and your partner have got pretty good alignment on where those lines are, it's going to be easier for you. And, and two things. I'm appalled at the level of domestic violence in society. Now, I raise this as an issue that says we need to make sure as fathers we're showing the right respect for the mother. I don't care if you're not in love or you're still married, you need to show respect for that mother. 
Why? If you're disrespectful, what do you think your sons are going to be to their partner in the future? Yeah. It's going to be acceptable for them to be disrespectful. You don't like that. If your mother, if the mother is taking all that rubbish from the father, what are the girls going to expect as the norm when they're in a relationship? And you don't want disrespect for your, your children to have that disrespect and lack of um, support. You don't want them in unsafe, unhappy relationships. Men have got to show that. And it's all right to talk about it when you're not seeing that in your community. Don't be afraid to talk to each other about ways of being respectful. You've got to honour the mother and make sure that the, the love of her as a mother is, is there strong for you seeing it as the father. Again, I don't care if you don't love that mother as your partner, that's not as relevant. You've got to show the love as a co-parent going forward. And reality is for the people who are suffering from um, divided families, the more honour, the more respect you can show for the mother, the easier it is in that split up in the relationship. Okay? I'd also give a challenge here. This is one... <coughs> Fathering Project is not a Christian um, organisation, but I add some parts into it from a Christian perspective because over half the volunteers with the Fathering Project come from a Christian background. Why? We get the idea about sharing as big family, about being that father figure, being caring, being loving. As a church community, you've got this fantastic opportunity to work as a, as a, as a community, mm. as a group of fathers together. Some children don't have a father living at home. Maybe the, the person's living overseas. Maybe they're divorced. Maybe they're separated. Maybe they've passed away. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of reasons why people may not have that father figure in their life. You as a community have an opportunity to step in and fill some of that void. That's the challenge for you guys to think, how can we be better fathers together? Which is the next stage after, how do I be a better father? How can we be better fathers together? So that's the teamwork part that I would, I would, I would throw to you. Yes, another slide please. One more tap. Thank you. Now, the Fathering Project, we've been really serious in the last two years about rolling out fathers' groups at schools. Why? We figure that the dads are ready to engage and do more when the children start to go to school, and we've set up a fathers' group at the schools. Too many of the PNCs are staffed and supported by the mums, with the dads not doing their. When dads do school drop-off, they probably do more drop-off. Drive, drop-off, buy, kiss, maybe not even get out of the car. It's hard for the dads to get into the school gates. This is me talking to principals. They don't do it as much as the mums. We're starting to change. But having dads in groups, we had an aim by the end of last year to have 100 dads groups in Perth operating. Well, we've got 120. This started in Perth. We've now got nearly 100 groups that have set up in Sydney and Melbourne so far this year. And we're finding a real richness of working with the schools and having a dad support group where we do three things. The dads get to meet each other to socialise. Because if I don't know another dad at the school, I'm probably going to be less likely to engage. So that's the social side. We provide dads and kids with activities to do together. That can be as simple as a camp out. Going to Bunnings and building and making a, um, what do you call them, a, a go-kart. Bunnings, I think it cost you $40 over four Saturdays. They want you taking your children to Bunnings. So they discount it and subsidize it. And you can do that through the school. You can have pipe making. You can have a bowls night. You can go fishing. There's umpteen different cycling together. There's a lot of different activities where you and the child can have fun with the other dads and the children at the school. And the third part is that on education. So we've got a number of things that we know within the Fathering Project that we can share. Today you're going to hear some of them, 
that there's ongoing development. And if you're a little bit like me, I need to be told more than once quite often about these particular aspects. So that's a great movement. If you would like to get involved, if, if you have a father's group at the school, I'd encourage you to get actively involved. If you don't, maybe two or three of you could think about setting up a father's group because it's bringing some really good things at the school. Two or three of you, and you need to put your hand up and then the fathering project will come along. We've got a schools manager and we, we have a program where we can engage the other dads and start to build a community at your school with the dads. Next one, thank you. Here's just some ideas of things that they're doing. It's all based around fun and letting your hair down with the, with the children. Next page, thank you. Men are not prolific readers, generally. Bruce Robinson wrote one of the books we've got there, Fathering in the Fast Lane. He wrote the book, um, but then he realised that men were struggling to read some of the books. He also was guilty, he put his hand up and said, look, there were these conferences and these books and these other aspects. He asked his wife to go away and give me the bullet points and tell me what I need to implement. And his wife was very obliging on that one. And then he realised, okay, we've got to break this barrier. It's an Australian colloquialism. It's called, we call it the blue book officially. Unofficially, it's called the dunny book. Dunny as in toilet. It's got 31 sections to it. Most of us have to go to the toilet once a day for a longer time, where you can sit and maybe not be on your phone and do emails or play games or check sport. There are bullet points in here for you to read. Today is the second. There are two, there are eight bullet points. This is one of the, the longer ones. Show children you love them. And it's got eight bullet points in there. Spending fun time with your kids is the simplest way to show you love them. Show love physically by appropriate hugs. Go out of your way to do things with them and for them especially if you are busy. So there are more into there. We're, get, we're, we're, we're going to give you one of these. If in fact I can have a couple of volunteers to help pass these out. There's one of, one of these for, for each of you. I've got some more. Okay, I'd highly recommend them. They're not difficult. The first month, for the month of September, maybe you'll only remember and start to implement one item that you like into, into that particular day. Maybe in three months time you've read it again and you've thought, I said I was gonna do it, but I haven't done it. Don't beat yourself up that you haven't done it. Think about positively what you can do again. But this is a really, really useful book. Really useful. Along with, along with this book, there's a website, or there's, a, there's an address, fpforme.org. We come up, has anyone got the Fathering Project tips on a weekly basis? Yes. I would recommend this. Now they're really, really simple. It's a tip. It's not a long email, it's a tip that comes in once a month, oh, once a week, sorry, and it says, it'll give you a little one sentence or a couple of bullet points on what to, what to be doing. I actually use it, I get mine on a Monday, and it says to me, Oi you, what am I doing to be a better dad this week? So something comes into my inbox, I see it, I'm reminded, what do I need to do to be a better dad? Some of the tips I really like, some of them I don't find as relevant. I'm not gonna find relevant about being engaged in your kinky play group anymore. But they're really simple, straightforward tips as to what you can be doing. Recommend it. You register on fpforme.org. Really simple, 
If you don't I like them, sorry. I know, and I've, we've tested this one. We are very quick at unsubscribing. We will. This is this is not a sold um, email listing that anyone else has access to. It's purely for you. The confidentiality in there of your email address. It's all there. It's it's a very secured one. Um, I can assure you in that aspect. I wrote for about three years tips on being a FIFO dad. And so it helped the dads that were on site as to how to do it. So I know what's involved behind the scenes and it worked very, very well. But yeah, that's that's your gift from today. Next one, thanks. One of the good things is we we for the first five or six years as a as a not-for-profit. We were struggling with money. We've actually been able to get some sponsors and some support. So I want to recognise these people. Um, so the telethon, we've now that I, I sold. I didn't realise. Well, we sold the books at the um, Assembly of God. They're normally they cost five dollars to make, but in fact, the recent deal that we've got is telethon have paid for that um, printing. So that that's one of the good things you have as a gift. West Farmers, Bunnings, PNN Bank, Amada, and the University of Western Australia. So they're people that have also some pretty good names into there, some pretty serious business heads behind that and boards that have said, yep, we want to get involved with the fathering project. They're doing some good things, which is great. Um, and the good thing is, from West Farmers, we've now got <laughs> such a great input. That's a real, real good stuff in there, eh? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> in conclusion, um, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Jaime Lechenko, who's been, uh, you know, I've known Brother Jaime for a, a long time, maybe since I've been with the church. And, uh, and he's a man of great organizational ability. And he does a lot of, that's his job working in his profession. And so, you know, he, uh, <clears throat> I've often had a burden myself for the men in our church. And I think some years ago, we started, had one, when we were still in Morley, you know, we had one men's meeting. And, uh, and then I thought, well, more. And then we, well, the general idea was, we're too busy, too many meetings. We didn't have enough time for our men's meeting. But uh, recently, Jaime Nachango uh, uh, got behind this. And because of his great gift, which is, organization and you know that's how we've come so far so uh, you know he's a great man family man uh, Jaime do you want to say a couple of words before closing I know he didn't want to but but I just want to give him a public we have to give honor where honor is due come on Jaime you know he's the he, he's the the motivating force, we get his emails and man, he liaises down to the point of organisation, everyone has a job. I've never been in such a highly organised movement. Thank you, Hyde, come on. I thought I to do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, think it's not just me, actually, it's uh, one of the guys who really uh, helped me a lot to uh, organise. I just delegate actually, <laughs> but uh, it's a big thanks to everyone and those who uh, joined this, this uh, very important event. And I really appreciate that lots of people turn out. We actually like targeting before like 30, probably 40, and we end up with 56. It's yeah, supposed to be 60, but it's a big big help for everyone and hopefully uh, this will not be just the first one and we're looking for the second or probably the ten. <laughs> so thank you so much and uh, hope you enjoy the uh, the words that uh, John Bennett shared to everyone, especially the father. Thank you so much. So we're just going to close in prayer, asking God's blessing on all the fathers and their families. Lord Jesus, we thank you for one another. Fellowship that we can have with you, Lord. And uh, we pray a special blessing upon every brother here today. Lord, 
uh, we look, we pray for the potential fathers, Lord, and the, and the fathers that have families. We ask for the spirit of wisdom, understanding, motivation, and all these attributes that you have, Lord, and that you want to pass them down to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you're the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you. And particularly the challenge of being good fathers, Lord. And we thank you for your blessing. Lord, may your beautiful face shine upon us and give us your beautiful peace in our hearts, Lord, and wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue now, fellowship. I'm sure there must be coffee and leftovers that we can eat and talk. And don't forget to pin brother down and ask him questions and talk with him. It, it won't be the last time we'll see him again. One little thing. There were some great conversations you were having between each other. Carry that on. Continue that. Something we as men struggle with and don't do enough. So well done. Do more. That's your chance. <laughs>